Dear ladies and gentlemen, friends in the Dhamma, greetings and sukihontu to all of you. My name is Aiden. I'm from Kimera Meta Buddhist Society, and I will be your MC for this wonderful evening. First and foremost, welcome to our online Dhamma sharing session on the Breaking Myths series. This Dhamma series is initiated and organized by Johor Gladians Meta Buddhist Fellowship in collaboration with the Cradle and Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia. We are also cross-broadcasting via Facebook Live with 16 Buddhist organizations across the country. Brothers and sisters, to commence our session this evening, let us pay homage to the Buddha, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the fully enlightened one by reciting the three refuges and five precepts. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sangang saranang gachami, Dutiyam bi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyam pi sangang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi sangang saranang gachami. Panati pata veramani sikha padam samaliyami. Adinadhana veramani sikha padam samaliyami. Kame sukmichachara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya matcha pamadatana Veramani sikha padang samadhi ami. Imani pancha sikha padani samadhi ami. Imani pancha sikha padani samadhi ami. Imani pancha sikha padani samadhi ami. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Glad evening, everyone. Welcome to another Breaking Myths series by Dr. Puna Wong. I believe Dr. Puna is no stranger to most of us here. However, for the newcomers, let me introduce him. Dr. Puna Wong is an Associate Professor in Internal Medicine with Monash University, Malaysia in the Johor Bahru campus. He has been sharing the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, and Jakarta in the past two decades. On a side note, 
he's a huge Star Wars fan. Dr. Puno authored his first Dharma book entitled Walking in the Buddha's Footprint in 2016. In October last year, he launched his second Dharma book entitled Breaking Myths and is now sharing the chapters from this book with us. How many teachers do we need? Ladies and gentlemen, do we need more than one teacher to excel in the learning of the Dharma? Or do we just need one teacher? In our life, we learn many things from many teachers. It is good in many ways. At the same time, it may be confusing by having too many sources of information and too many different instructions. I, to have struggled through this issue many, many times. Well, let us hear from Dr. Puna Wong on this topic. I need many teachers. Over to you, Dr. Puna. Okay, Adam, please let me share screen. Right. Okay. Good evening, Dhamma family. I'm very happy tonight because we have another one more young center that has joined us, and that is Putra Heights. And we are very, very happy to welcome Putra Heights into this big family. And it has been my vision for many years that has not been fulfilled. And one vision is that we can unify the so many Buddhist centers scattered all over our country into a voice. And one of the things that I had hoped to do before, of course, COVID-19 stopped us all in our tracks, is that we should be able to move around the country, sharing, for example, at Kinwara, and then cross linking it to all the various centers of the country, because the Buddha Dharma is universal, and we should not be divided into small little groups, each with blinkers. So now we are in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, at least we have the internet to unite, to, to unite us. And as I said, I'm so very happy that we've got 16 groups. And of course, our newest member of the family, Putra Heights, a big welcome to you all. Tonight, I'm going to share on this, whether we need many teachers or a teacher or a few teachers. And how many of you here know that Lisa Simpson probably the most intelligent member of the family of the Simpsons is a Buddhist. And here is one episode whereby he met, she met Richard Gere, who was one of her teachers. I love this Chan teaching. I wish to share with you and I hope that it will really strike into you and give you that aha moment because Chan teachings require direct insight. There's this visiting monk, and he went across mountains and valleys to reach this great teacher called Venerable Joshu in Japanese or Zhao Zhou in Chinese. And he said to Venerable Zhao Zhou, I have just entered the monastery. Please teach me. And the great teacher replied, have you eaten your rice porridge? The monk replied, yes, I have eaten. And Zhao Zhou replied, then you better wash your bowl. And at that moment, this visiting monk was awakened. Now, Sister Li Ming, Brother Aiden is supposed to now go into retreat for three years and meditate on this Kung An, and then come and tell me of their insights. But our life of instant coffee, instant noodles, and instant milk powder does not allow us this luxury nowadays. And hence, I will go on. This is a very, very profound teaching. 
in Chan training traditionally, a student will train for at least a decade in the suttas before they embark on intensive meditation training. And after that, as there was no internet, they will actually walk over great distances from one center to another to be tested by the abbots of all these centers as to their understanding of the Dhamma. And this was the, the curriculum of those days. And such was this student who crossed mountains and valleys to find this very famous master Zhao Zhou or Joshu in Japanese. And their very brief conversation is very profound. And this is where Li Ming will go, aha, after three years of meditation on this Kung An. The visiting monk said, please teach me. He was still looking for another guru, another teaching, another sensei, another ajahn, another bante, maybe another shortcut, or maybe another tip, a top secret mantra perhaps, something that will help him become awakened. Now, actually we are all like that monk. We have all read volumes. Some of us here would have read maybe half of the Tipitaka. Have you not listened to innumerable talks? Most of you will have heard hundreds of Dhamma talks from famous teachers like Ajahn Brahm all the way to our Malaysian, Singaporean, Indonesian teachers. You know that during the Buddha's time, if you read the Pali Canon, the monk will often approach the Buddha, having only probably the opportunity to see him once every few years, and then ask the Buddha, oh, please teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that I may go back and contemplate, reflect, think, meditate, etc., on that teachings. They only had one teacher, and the teachings were sparse and in between. Today, we are like this venerable who is traveling. Now we travel through the internet and we have got access to huge amounts of talks, books, written material, huge amounts. And yet we keep looking for more. The great master asked him, have you eaten? He replied, yes. Now all of us here, have eaten a lot. We have actually tok pao si, as we say in Cantonese. You are filled to your pharynx with knowledge, and yet we want more. The great teacher with great compassion said, Ni zi pao ma? His reply, si pao la. And the venerable Zhao Zhou replied, qi si wan. Just that, enough theory, enough tutorials. Whatever you have learned, please apply it in the present moment in everyday life. See one or wash your bowls is probably the most mundane thing on earth besides sweeping the floor. Very mundane things. The Dhamma is to be applied in all these very, very mundane things of life. It is not an academic pursuit, but to be applied and practiced in every moment of our mundane lives. Chi si wan. Such great pedagogy. So if you come to Johor Bahru and you meet the gladians of Johor Bahru, they will often use this, ni tsu pao ma? And then you reply, tsu pao la they will say qi si wan, because they had learned this from me. The play of words is beautiful. Sister Su Chen, you are also already full. You do not need me to send you more suttas, although I just did a few days ago. Sister Su Chen, qi si wan. Now this teaching breaks the common practice seen today of guru shopping all over the world, internet centers, and of course the internet has made it very easy. It teaches us that there is no magic formula. There is no shortcut. 
there is no link to Nibbana that you can cut, copy and paste onto your brain. It is just the sheer determination to live in the moment, in real life, with mindfulness. Now we have all learned a lot. Now let us apply it in our daily lives. And this is what we need. For the rest of my sharing, the word application will come in. Sister May Chong, I give you the duty of counting how many times the word application appears in this talk. The Buddha Dharma is not a religion. I've already shared that at length, but a way of life. There is no God notion for anyone to pledge loyalty, believe in or seek forgiveness. There is no omniscient, omnipotent creator, but cause and effect. Something that took modern science a few thousand years to understand and only really understand better in the 16th century, 17th century onwards. There's no being to worship, praise, or demand favors in return. It is the dedicated application of the Dhamma. That is the Buddha Dhamma. I want to remind all, everyone, including myself, what Buddhism or the Buddha Dharma is not. It is not idol worshiping. That is for sure. When we bow down in respect to an image of the Buddha, we are not bowing down to stone, marble, bronze, but we are bowing down to what the image represents. Wisdom, loving kindness, compassion. We are actually bowing down to your future self. You are bowing down to what you can become. And the application here is all of us try to live according to our teachers' standards of wisdom, loving kindness, and compassion. Whatever devotional practices you might follow, offering candles, flowers, incense, etc., please remember they are educational. The Buddha is not going to eat your fruit or your flower. It is an education for yourself to remember impermanence when you offer flowers, to remember the Buddha Dharma as the GPS of your life when you offer a lighted candle, etc. It is to teach us, to remind us about cause and effect when you offer a fruit, because from the seed will arise the fruit. If you offer an apple, that apple seed cannot give rise to a durian. It can only give rise to another apple. So uh, the onus is on us to apply the Dhamma in our everyday life. For example, you are all taught about sila. Pancha sila is what we just chanted. Now the word sila in Pali is the same as in Malay. And we are so blessed in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia that we understand Malay. Sila means manners, behavior, respect. For what? For harmonious living, for a harmonious community. Effectively, this is what the pancha sila that we just recited when kept when practice leads to harmonious living. You will realize, brothers and sisters, that there is absolutely nothing in the pancha sila which is religious. No forgiveness, no praise, nothing. They are entirely secular human values that leads to harmonious living. And these ethics begin with no harm to oneself and others. Applying the Dhamma to everyday life is to understand how the mind functions psychologically. Because the Buddha Dharma is a very profound study of human psychology, the psycho versus the logical. 
And as I said, his goal is harmonious living as you walk this path to awakening. When the Buddha came in the fifth, sixth century, he taught a way which would be considered extremely radical because he went against what was held dear, what was believed right at that time. And I've listed it up in bright yellow. He taught a way devoid of authority. He moved the whole focus away from the metaphysical, away from a supreme divine being, some God, he moved it all away and said, no, the focus is not on an external being. The focus is on brother U. You, not an external being. And how many of you realize that in the Buddha Dharma, there is no rituals? The only ritual is in the Vinaya prescribed for ordination, for Katina, for new moon, full moon, for the Sangha. And the Buddha taught another thing, which was very, very scientific. He told people, from your experience, experiential, even the Four Noble Truths each have three aspects. You have to see it from your own experience, not by the words of another person, not on blind faith to what another person said. And in the Kalama Sutta, he taught everyone who wanted to listen, use your wisdom. Don't just chuck tradition away. Sometimes people quote the Kalama Sutta and say, the Buddha said, chuck wisdom, chuck tradition, chuck holy book, chuck this, chuck that. No, 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 no. That's not true. If you read the Kalama Sutta properly, the Buddha did not tell us to chuck anything away, but to use your wisdom to see whether what is prescribed as wisdom in the tradition, in the books, in your culture, in your teaching, in your teacher, whether it is harmful, whether it is wholesome, whether it is good for you, good for others. Use your wisdom. And the Buddha moved away. In the Vinaya, he made it clear. It's no sacred language. Use the local language. This would have made the Buddha a rebel. If he is alive today and he had taught the same thing, he could well have been arrested in many countries. So the Noble Eightfold Path that you are all familiar with are all ways in which we utilize to make ourselves better people, living in harmony, and finally, awakening to what is real in nature. Not what we hope or what we imagine or what we demand, but what is reality. And no teacher can make you awake. No teacher can put a USB port in his brain and transfer it into your brain. He can only share the Dhamma. You need to reflect and use it yourself. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, put it so simply, so well. This is my simple religion, he said. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Your own brain, your own heart is your temple. The philosophy is simply kindness. And the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh also put it so well, forget the afterlife. It's all about living now, doing your best now. Forget the metaphysical. Buddhism has to do with your daily life, with your dukkha, and with the suffering or dukkha of the people around you. Ethics, the very foundation. Remember, if you live it, you create harmonious living. I'm going to ask questions. Ethics, I have already said, sea lion Malay. Ask yourself now, why are these ethics, these values necessary for mankind? You don't need a prophet. You don't need a holy book to tell you this. 
your common sense will tell you why. What is the relationship between civilization and ethics? Again, you don't need a prophet or a holy book to tell you this. Use your own wisdom. What is the very primary ethic of medicine? Well, this I've got to tell you because there are not that many doctors in the group, but the primary ethic, the primary principle of ethics in medicine is primum non nocere, Latin. In English, first, do no harm. Even if you can't help, do no harm. And that is a universal value. Now, in Buddhism, it is listed, classified, 10 unwholesome behaviors, which leads to destruction of harmonious life. Again, most of you are familiar with this. Do you realize that the five precepts that we just took covers all 10 of these 10 unwholesome behaviors which leads to destruction of harmonious living? So it is not whether 20 teachers have taught Sister Liming about the 10 precepts or the eight precepts or the five precepts, it is whether Sister Liming is applying these five precepts in her daily life. And the eight or the 10 precepts may be on special days. It is its application. We can learn this, listen to this a hundred times. If we do not apply it, it is no different from not hearing it even once. So as you can see, these do not belong to any religion. It belongs to rational mind, logical mind, sensible people. And all of us here are lay people. I'm not aware of any Sangha attending. So we all need to earn a living. And the Buddha very clearly taught us about righteous wealth, which is wealth earned without breaking these five precepts. Now, many people set financial goals, which is good. But very often, the only goal post of their financial goal is making money. If you are like that, I think we need to reflect a little bit deeper as to why you need to make the money. Yes, of course, feed the family, raise the children, educate them, etc. And it is very important to have money and financial freedom. But then after that, what? What are you going to do? So what does financial freedom mean to you? And I think that application of righteous wealth, which I have actually talked about a few times, earning a living harmlessly, and then utilizing that wealth is the Buddha Dharma. Now, when you're hungry, you need food. We need company of friends. We want enlightenment. We want good things. We want 4K TV. We want M1 Mac processor. The challenge is for us to distinguish between what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. If you need it, of course, use it, buy it. Now, Dr. Quack, as practice matures, you will learn to distinguish between what supports your practice and what hinders your practice. Now, we all live in a material culture. All you need to do is switch on the television. The advertisements assault you endlessly. Buy, buy, smoke, drink, etc. The challenge is not getting snapped by it. No one says it's easy and we all stumble. But we practice, greed and desire loses its power to push you around as you gain the wisdom to realize that there is more beyond just simple greed and desires. So one of the applications is contentment to one endless. Our needs have to be settled, but our wants 
are endless. So the day comes when you want nothing more than you want something all the time. It gives you tremendous freedom. So you find very often such advice given on the internet. I just took one as an example. Good advice. But basically all this advice teaches you what I've just said, be content, treat everybody well, make sure you don't harm anybody, live mindfully, make sure that you live a life that is wholesome. Now, I've been asked this question so many times, including in this very forum that we are sharing now. There are people who fear that, oh, if I do all this, then I'll be like a rock, a stone without feelings. No, 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 dear brother and sister. I assure you that will not happen. On the contrary, genuine metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, genuine loving kindness and compassion, joy and equanimity, it can only occur when you realize the Buddha Dharma. When you realize that the individual me and the individual you are mistaken ideas and that we are all interconnected. As long as we keep thinking, what is in it for me? You haven't reached there yet. Now, unfortunately, because of the problem with English words, we are stuck with calling these four Brahma Viharas emotions. We are stuck. The early translated, translators used the word emotions and we have become stuck. And over these months that I had shared with you, I had raised the problem. Many of our myths, many of our issues are because of translation issues. These four Brahma Viharas, Viharas or noble abodes are in reality what the wholesome mind will live in. It's the abode of the wholesome mind. It's the living quarters of the wholesome mind. That means you will live in that sort of mind state when you genuinely understand non-self and the interconnectedness of everyone and everything. Then you will naturally act with metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. As a start, develop metta for yourself and your loved ones, your family, your friends. And then make sure you apply this principle by doing everything you can to create the causes for happiness. You cannot create happiness, but you can create the causes for happiness. And this I raised again because now we are living in very difficult times. Compassion, it's extremely important. But we must never forget that the Buddha say, may all beings be happy and well. May all beings include you yourself. So while you are wanting to be compassionate to other people, please do not forget to be compassionate to yourself as well. The Buddha never taught us to treat yourself worse than you treat other beings. It is made all beings be happy and well. You are part of all beings. And this I raise because there are people who have raised this similar question to me. Self-compassion is just as important as compassion to other people. So do a locate quiet time for yourself. Of course, you help others. And when you love, you love yourself as well. You honor your body as well. Now, many of you have met me in person. And when you meet me in person, very often, you offer me a nice cup of excellent tea. Sister Angeline fed us very well. Brother Dr. Quack took me to have a cup of excellent tea. And you asked me, please order the best. Order what you really love in this bistro, because you are kind to me or you respect me. 
then you must even be kinder to yourself. You must also make sure that you have your nice cup of excellent tea or coffee or food. You have to respect yourself and offer the best to yourself too. Another very important application. Wu, I've shared before. In ancient times, when people ask the Tan masters, what have you learned from all your years of training? They will turn back at you and shout, Wu! And of course, most people don't understand. They thought all these Tan masters are a bit mad. But I've already shared this before. The etymology or origin of the word Wu is of a person with the arm, arms outstretched, holding lots and lots of things in this arm and that arm. Attachment holding. The word that evolved to be Wu implies or teaches the opposite. Let go. That's why they, when asked, the Tan master will reply, Wu. No attachment. Wu zi yi wu de. Yi wu suo de gu. We have to let go because in reality, we don't own anything. Not even your own body. Not even your own children. Finally, we have to let go because we don't own anything ultimately. And for the many things that had gone wrong, perhaps, the only way to heal is to let go. And, and our insight into karma is very important and had a huge application here. Remember, karma is cause and effect. Cause and effect that arise from our intentions. What is the intention behind what we want to do? That creates karma. And while the ordinary person is very afraid of the fruits of karma, which is what they experience now. Everything that you experience now is the fruit of your past karma. So for example, if you are living a nice, comfortable life because you studied very hard in education, in university, in a profession, that was the seed that you planted then. Now is the fruit that you are enjoying. So for the ordinary person, they are very afraid of the fruits, the discomfort, and the things that they find unpleasant now. But they do not realize that how they respond to the present situation, whether good or bad, is laying the seeds for the future. That's why the wise person, he is very afraid of the seeds. Ying. The ordinary unenlightened being is very afraid of the war, what he is experiencing now. So it is difficult to be rid of your present war. Nobody will complain about their present happiness, but they will complain about the present unhappiness. And to stop dukkha is not to say dukkha stop, but to let go of the causes of dukkha. Greed, craving, attachment, ignorance, delusion, wrong views. So we deal with the cause, not the effect. And this is a paradigm shift in thinking that I have repeated many a times in the last few months on this forum. Another application, we are all part of the Dhamma family Right now, 341 Dhamma family members are watching. You are kayanamitas, or spiritual friends, or noble friends, or true friends. Apply this teaching. The Buddha said, true friends, or noble friends, or kayanamitas is your entire spiritual life. Not just half, a quarter, a third but your entire spiritual life because we revolve our lives around family and friends. And for many of us, 
We actually revolve our life around friends more than family because many, many family members have gone overseas. Both my children are overseas. It's only my wife and I. Many of my relatives, old as they are, are in Kuala Lumpur. And their own children are also overseas. So back in Johor Bahru, my life revolves around my spiritual friends. And of course, my medical students. So our spiritual friends become extremely important because they play all these roles of making sure they protect us, they help us, they advise us, they are compassionate, etc., etc. They lead us to continue, they encourage us to continue to walk the Eightfold Path. And then we go away, we deviate, a good spiritual friend will stop us and drag us back to the Eightfold Path. Thank you, my spiritual friends. I owe you a debt. Application. We learn so much about the Dhamma. In one of the coming talks, I'm going to talk about death and dying. Now, death is a great teacher. It is often said that if you attend a funeral of someone you know, it is better than you attending 10 Dhamma lessons. You will see the realities of life. Now, you know, our life every day, so many changes, especially recently. Now, every one of them is a little death. We are constantly being reborn moment to moment. Now, it is, of course, finally, ultimately important to die well. But it is more important to live every moment well as if it is your last. And it may well be your last because everything is impermanent, unpredictable, anatta. And when you have insight into impermanence and non-self, you begin to realize that whether you live in a huge three-story house, a mansion, or a small little shed, or you drive a huge BMW versus a small little Myvi, our graves ultimately are the same size. So no matter how big your house, your car, your bank account is, the grave it's always the same size. And you cannot take anything along with you beyond taking along your karma. Of course, when you study the Buddha Dharma, you realize that even death is impermanent. Our nature includes even death. Even death is just a moment. And I've shared this many times, that when you truly understand emptiness, when you understand Everything, all dhamma, all phenomena, dhamma as in small d here, all phenomena, everything has the characteristic of emptiness, non-self, anatta, impermanence. Then you understand even death is impermanent. So another application is learning to still our minds. And for most of us, we spend our life chasing this and trying to avoid this. And the Buddha very clearly taught, what is the difference between, he said, a well-trained student of mine and a run of a mill one. The well-trained one, he said, when he sees this and this, his mind remains in samadhi. Calm, still. The word samadhi does not mean concentration. I have said that so many times. Concentration is a wrong translation of the word samadhi. The word samadhi means still. In Chinese, in the Agamas, it is translated as zhen ting. So whether you are praised or blamed, whether people condemn you or say you are a saint, your mind remains still, not like that. So we need to develop this skill of stillness, sama samadhi. So its application, 
when you can train your mind to still your mind, when you are faced with a situation, you do not respond with unwise or unskillful or unwholesome manner. You respond with Brahma Vihara. When your mind is still and calm, you live in the abodes of Brahma. This, which I have already mentioned. So its application is simple and yet profound. Simple as in, if I'm asked, how do we apply the Dhamma in daily life? Oh, Dana Sila Bhavana. Three words. So simple. And yet these three words are so profound. I have shared at length on Dana in previous Friday night sharings. This is actually the easiest. It's teaching you to Dana your time, your resources, your skill. For example, we have people in the organizing committee who are very skilled in IT. I wouldn't know how to run whatever they are doing now. They Dana their skills in IT. Some are very artistic. So they dana their artistic skills to make the posters. The dana of time, the dana of knowledge, that's very noble because this is not easy. And then I just spoke, spoke at length about precepts or sila for harmonious living. Now the third, bhavana, I need to explain a little bit more because I noticed that there are people who are confused with the word bhavana. I said last week, bhavana does not mean meditation. Bhavana is development through mental training. And bhavana is a continuous process, 24 hours. You heard of the word Dhamma Nupasana. Dhamma, teachings of the Buddha or the realities of life. Nupa, from the word Anu, again and again and again and again, Pasana. I recall, I think, I remember, I contemplate, I reflect. So Dhamma Nupasana is reflection of the Dhamma all the time in whatever the six senses come in contact with. You develop through mental training and meditation is only one aspect of bhavana. And meditation is like lifting up a stick with two ends. On one end, samatha training to develop stillness or samadhi. Why? This trains your emotional mind so that you do not behave like what I said just now with hatred, jealousy, anger, instead with metta karuna mudita. And you need vipassana. You need that insight, that wisdom, because that trains your intellectual mind, your logical training, your logical understanding, your logical analytical skills. So bhavana is xiu xi in Chinese. Xiu, you know, is cultivation. See, is to do it repeatedly. And that's why I keep on saying it is a 24 hour thing. Even when you are asleep, Sister Su Chen, you should be dreaming about this and not dreaming about, I don't know, some Korean superstar or something. Do you know that if you go to bed thinking about the Dhamma, you will also dream about the Dhamma. And when you wake up in your morning, your first thought, also revolves around the Dhamma. Try it tonight. Try it. I guarantee you that. Now, formal meditation, Brother Wu, is perhaps maybe 15 minutes, an hour. That's all. It's only one aspect of Bhavana. Bhavana is 24 hours. So meditation is one preparation for Bhavana, training the mind to be still, Training the mind to see directly with insight. 
And this has to go along with knowledge, right views, right intention, sila, livelihood, right effort, so that you can activate living with calmness or stillness and mindfulness throughout the day. Here, it so happened that this evening, my Tanya texted me with regards to this. She's my spiritual heir, to be very honest with you. And we discussed over the text some difficulties she had with the words. One, the word sati, samasati, which again the early translated translators translate as mindfulness. Now, are you aware that there is no English word called mindfulness in the English dictionary? It's a word they created because there was no such word. Are you living with caution, thinking of cause, effect? Are you living with awareness? And here, awareness is not a noun. If you look at the English dictionary, it states that awareness is a noun. That's wrong. And my Kanye wants to write to Oxford English Dictionary to tell them that they are wrong. It should be a verb. Are you living with heedfulness? Now, sometimes you see two words, sati sampajana. Perhaps when placed together, it tells us something which we might understand better because sampajana is a compound word, full knowledge or awareness. Are we living with full awareness in daily life? Because that is what Bhavana demands. And that's why you will see in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha spoke about meditation in sitting posture, walking posture, lying posture, okay, standing posture. Literally, that means the 24 hours posture. And even Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote it in this article that the word translating, that the translation of sati is really very problematic. All right, as what I had described. Now here I want to bring you to year one medicine and try and teach you a little bit about neuroanatomy and how our mind functions. Brother Chubun, you do not have one brain. You actually have three brains. At the very lowest most of your brain is what we call the old brain. The same brain the dinosaur and the lizard today has, your brain stem, which controls your life. How fast your heart is beating, how fast you are breathing, your body temperature, etc., etc. It doesn't communicate in language. It has no sound, nothing. So if you're frightened, your pupils dilate. If you're scared, your heart rate goes up. That's the brain stem. It's what determines the very basic operating system of you to keep you alive. And when doctors say you are brain dead, well, so sorry the most primitive part of your brain is no longer functioning. And then on top of that, you have a complex system that evolved maybe a few million years ago called the limbic system. And basically the limbic system controls our emotions. So you have emotions of fear, anger, happiness. You want sex, you want to kill somebody, all these are emotions and dogs are a very good example of an animal that has evolved its limbic system very well. That's why a dog will love you unconditionally. I know Brother Chubun is very scared of dogs, but I assure you dogs will love you unconditionally because their emotional mind is very highly developed. But that same dog will bite kill, tear what it will perceive as an enemy. That dog is not going to sit down and analyze, oh, this is Chubun's cousin, brother's friend. I should not do anything. If that guy walks in, it's going to bite it, him, because it functions on emotions. 
And then about 200,000 years ago, we developed what we call the neocortex at the front. And this is the mind that gave us Mozart, the beauty of Amadeus, the mind that gave us Einstein, the mind that gave us Newton, the mind that also gave us Picasso. That is the logical analytical mind. Not very old, maybe two to 300,000 years. And that's why if you look at the skulls of the Homo afarensis, Australopithecus, you see the front part here is very, very angled back because their neocortex is not that well developed. Human beings develop wisdom tooth problem because this came forward and that went in. Now, how many of you here realize, dear Dharma brothers and sisters, that the Buddha Dharma teaches us to evolve this thinking process? Samatha meditation or calmness meditation or stillness meditation trains Dr. Quack to calm his emotional mind. Are we aware that many, many of our decisions made in a day is driven by emotions? We buy on impulse. That's why advertisers make use of that. That's why shopping malls have beautiful advertisements and displays because it wants you to develop greed so that you will buy on impulse. In contrast, the man who is thinking logical, using his intellect, will be something like Mr. Spock of Star Trek. Mr. Spock has a highly developed logical mind because the Vulcans train their children right from young to use logic, rationality, and suppress their emotional mind. But you need both to come to wise decisions. And the logical mind is trained with vipassana meditation or insight meditation to help you see into impermanence, into dukkha, into anatta. To help you see beyond what your mind creates. To help you see what is real. So I've put this in a very simplified manner. So you've got your higher cortex where you think analytically. And when your emotions are calm and relaxed, you tend to think analytically very well. A chess player cannot be playing very well when he is very emotional because he needs to think, to analyze. And once your emotions become very high, you disable the higher cortex and you kill the fellow you fight. You see people go mad over a Liverpool match. Why? That's because emotions have taken over. You see people fight in a pub. Why? Again, because higher cortical function is now disabled. Now, most people work at a very emotional level. Samatha meditation trains you to calm that emotional mind. Insight meditation trains you to develop logic. Ideally, your logical mind should be the one that determines your decisions. But many of our decisions are made because we are hurt, we are angry, we turn red with anger, literally, and the higher cortex is disabled. So please remember, Dhamma brothers and sisters, that emotions are only temporary states of mind. Do not let a temporary state make you make a permanent decision. Those of my generation will remember Star Trek. Of course, now there are many reruns and many newer versions. The Vulcans, they highly value logic. Mr. Spock, of course, is the icon of the Vulcans. He has emotions. Some people think he has no, but no, he has emotions. Just that he do not allow his emotions to predominate. While Captain Kirk, it's the opposite. He always makes, or rather, a lot of times he makes decisions based on emotions. So logic is only the beginning of wisdom, not the end. Now, when we deal with people, remember, most of the time we are dealing with creatures of logic or creatures of emotion. 
No. Sadly, most of the time, we are dealing with creatures of emotion. People who are creatures of logic, of course, are there. But you can immediately see it. They are calm. They are not so easily irritable, irritated. And they respond calmly and unemotionally. In contrast, many people are creatures of emotion. All you got to do is say two things. They get angry and then they start making decisions, saying things which you know are the result of their limbic system, not their cortex. So if you look in your own life, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, you actually see evolution. You actually see it in yourself. When you are a child, when you are a teenager, emotions became very, very big in your decision making. That's why you have puppy love. That's why people experiment with drugs and all kinds of crazy things. Because the frontal cortex, the neural cortex, is undeveloped. And it takes maybe mid-20s before the frontal cortex is well developed. And then you can see, why are you so childish? Why do we mean when we say, why are you so childish? That means you are making decisions not based on logic or rationality, but basing it on your emotions. I want to go out. Why can't I stay out beyond 12 o'clock? Why can't I wear this low cut dress? You can see these are emotionally driven decisions. So you can see in ourselves evolution as you grow from child to teenager to adult. And of course, some adults after strokes or vascular dementia, etc., you actually see the reverse process. You see them going backwards, devolution. Now, the Buddha Dharma trains us to evolve our minds, to master our emotions in the journey across life's polluted river. You see, the river I put up there is very polluted. From the shore of ignorance, grasping an emotional behavior to the further bank of wisdom and awakening. As I mentioned just now, Dhamma Nupasana is a non-stop 24-hour activity for the one serious in this effort. Watching phenomena through your five senses and your mind, examining your experience in accordance with the Dhamma. In other words, seeing through the eyes of the Buddha. You know, I often ask people when they ask me, and I said, what would the Buddha do? in that situation. Reflect upon that. Now, religions in the name of God issue dogmas. And you know, dogmas cannot be challenged, cannot be crossed. You accept it or you get excommunicated, my way or the highway. This is organized religion. But there is this line of ignorance, greed and hatred or delusion that must be crossed before you can arrive at one's enlightened state or awakened state or what is called Buddha nature. Now the Buddha is not a god or deva. He's a fully awakened being. And he, the teacher, encourages you that you must cross this line yourself. He cannot do it for you. You have to do it yourself. And it is best in the company of your Kayanamitas, which is why this little group that we have formed, about 300 over people every Friday night and about four to 5,000 on the internet, is a good group that I told the organizers we must maintain even when this series ends, because these are valuable Kayanamitas. The most powerful influencer of beliefs is not Chakap Chakap Chakap, for my Singaporean audience, talk, talk, talk. The most powerful influencer of beliefs is direct experience. When you live a life that is happy, peaceful, calm, and noble, people around you will notice and they want to know why, how. Especially if they see this joker last time smoke and drink, uh, smoke like a chimney, drink like a fish, only interest in life is money, money, money. 
some women, 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 etc., etc. But now he has completely changed. His direction is changed. He's so much happier, more calm, more peaceful, more rational. The whole focus of his life has changed. Why? And of course, if you're very happy, people will want to know why. Remember, Dhamma family, the Buddha Dharma is the way to supreme happiness. If you are walking this path, you must be happy. If you are not happy, something is seriously wrong. Because walking this path makes you happy. So when we apply these teachings, we do not aim to change other people, but to change ourselves. If other people want to change, if other people do not want to change, all this is their decision. If other people do not want to change, you cannot do anything, not even if it is your own family member. And if you insist, then you only end up with more people suffering. You can only help if the other person wants to accept your help. And they are only ready to accept your help when they can see the example in our own lives. So it is not the number of teachers that you have, but whether you are applying the teachings. 20 teachers, zero application is no different from zero teachers. One single teacher and you have a committed application that is even better than 20 teachers for which you have done nothing. And I thought this little meme is very useful. Why am I not advancing in my technique master? Someone asked the question, why am I not enlightened? Have you seen the sea sunset when the seagulls fly flaming across the plain? Yes, master. And the water from the waterfall hitting the rock without achieving anything? Yes, master. And the moon reflecting on calm water? Yes, master. Master say, that's your problem. You keep watching stupid things instead of practicing. That's why you are not progressing. It's a meme, of course, but it's interesting. This is my last slide, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Unless we master our mind, we will remain the slaves of our emotions and become locked in a primordial state. Our actions speak so loudly that none can hear what we say. Ultimately, the Buddha Dharma teaches us how to master your mind. Think, brothers and sisters, of all the Dharma lessons you have learned or read or seen on the internet, they all point in one's direction. Master your mind. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, over to you, Aiden. Hello, Aiden. Aiden, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Puna, for the Dharma sharing. Well, hope all of us will have a dream about the Dharma tonight. Now, we would like to open for questions. Please post your questions in the comment section. I shall read out your questions. Okay, let's start the ball rolling. The first question is from um, Brother Wen Ken. His question is, what is the distinction between faith and genuine sada? How ought we to act in order to avoid falling into blind faith? What is the way to cultivate real sada? Dr. Puna? Ken, good to see you here. I've actually shared this in a previous talk on this series. You can dig it out from among the, the talks that have been posted up. But the word sada, again, is mistranslated. The early translators translate sada as faith, F-A-I-T-H, which is not what the Buddha meant. In fact, 
if you, in your mind, think of the word faith, whenever you see the word sada, then you are going to completely misunderstand the direction of the Buddhist teachings. A closer word to what the word sada means is confidence. Blind faith is never accepted in the Buddha Dharma. Genuine confidence is when you have seen for yourself that what is taught by the Buddha is true. For example, the three universal characteristics, anicca, impermanence. Look around you, Brother Ken. Look within you. Is it permanent? Is it impermanent? Ask yourself that question. Then look around you at Dukkha. Dukkha is much more than suffering. Dukkha means emo, dissatisfaction, unhappiness, etc. Look around you. And in this era of the pandemic, that is all too obvious. And anatta, non-self. Look around yourself. Can you control your body? Can you stop yourself from falling sick? Can you stop yourself from aging? These are examples. And of course, the same goes for the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. And you begin to realize that what the Buddha taught is absolutely true. Then you have confidence because your ehi pasiko, come and experience, has shown it to be true. So if I tell you, Brother Ken, that you've got two arms and two legs and you accept it on my word, that is faith. But if you look at yourself and you see that you have two arms and two legs, now you know. You do not need to have blind faith in what I tell you. Now you have confidence. So it is very important to know that the way to develop the first faculty of sada is you need the view, the intention, the knowledge, the contemplation, the analysis, opening your eyes and seeing that what the Buddha taught is verified by your own experience. Then you know you do not need to have any form of faith. All right? Yes, thank you, Aiden. The next question is, uh, is from Alison, uh, Sister Alessandra Chin. How to make a decision if the feeling and logic come into conflict on certain cases? Dr. Puna? Well, Huishan, this is what Dukkha is about. What you've asked is actually a very fundamental question, which is very important. Why do we feel dissatisfaction, dukkha, unhappiness? Well, that's because your mind is in discordance. So for example, you see a lovely dress and you say, ah, I want to buy that dress. The emotions, I need that beautiful gown, you know, it's so beautiful, it's this, it's that. And then your mind tells you, are you sure? Are you really got so many gowns at home, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you have this conflict which arises in your mind. It causes discordance. One part of your brain, your limbic system is firing away, telling you one thing. Another part of your brain is firing away, telling you another. Well, let me give you a very common example. Food. Doctor tells you you're diabetic. Don't eat so much sugar. Cut down on carbo. And of course, for the first week, it works. Then the second week, the limbic system, which is the older brain, and the older software predominates. Huh? I hope you realize that. Evolution means the newer software has to be cultivated. The older software will say, eat la, it's so wonderful, you know, it's so beautiful, the delicious moon, moon cake, whatever cake, lava cake. And you have a discordance in your brain. The, the logical brain tells you, no la, better don't eat la. And then the, the limbic system tell you why wow, so nice la, eat la. And that's when we have dukkha. Because it is no longer in concordance. It is in discordance. It's the same thing when your computer breaks down, Huishan. You buy your wonderful computer, you expect it to last forever. Your emotion is that this is a very good computer. It must last forever. But is that reality? It's not. The computer breaks down, it gets corrupted. 
Your logical mind would have told you all computers will get corrupted. Get real, sister. It's already corrupted from the day you bought it. But our emotional mind does not accept it. And of course, we feel hurt. We feel sad. We give rise to dukkha. So when you understand the Buddha Dharma, we calm our emotional mind and we train the logical mind. And you begin to see that life can be in accordance when your demands are not against what is reality. When your demands flow in accordance to reality. Okay? So this is a big topic. What gives rise to Dukkha? Why is it that when we fall sick, we cannot accept it? Because we think we should live forever. Our bodies should live forever. But the reality is not. And the Buddha Dharma is to train your intellectual mind with insight that you know that this is the reality of life so that your emotions do not provide that negative, unwholesome feeling when the reality occurs. Okay? That is Sukha. Okay, Aiden? Thank you. Third question, uh, same from uh, same person uh, as the second question, uh, Sister Alessandra Chin. Her question is, if a person neglects too much of feeling, emotion, and only makes decision based on the logical mind, will this affect his or her happiness? Well, Open. Sister Alexandra, you remember just now I showed you the few slides. I showed you Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock's mind is entirely trained to be logical from the day he was born. Mr. Spock is half Vulcan. The Vulcans are a race that values logic. So right from childhood, every Vulcan child is trained to think logically, rationally. And that's why one of Mr. Spock's most common expressions is when he hears the others make decisions, he will reply, that's illogical because it is not in the flow of logic. Captain Kirk, on the other hand, is a very emotional man. A lot of times he makes decisions based on emotions. Remember just now, I said to you, Metta Karuna Mudita Upeka. Unfortunately, when early translators translated it, they dumped it into the category of emotions. But those four are Brahma Viharas. Those four are the abodes of nobility. When your mind understands reality, when your mind understands anicca dukkha anatta, when your mind understands emptiness, your mind dwells in that state of metta, mudita, upeka, karuna. So I told you in my slide, logic is the beginning of wisdom. That logic has to be tempered by metta, mudita, metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. The problem with us as unenlightened beings is that our feelings are all the emotions which revolve around I. What is it in there for me? Now notice this is completely different from the Brahma Viharas or Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, where it is not around I. Our emotions evolve around I. When a boy falls in love with a girl, do you honestly think that that boy loves the girl? No. I'll be very frank here. That boy loves the feeling that he has when he is with the girl. That is why he has so many demands on the girl, NYC was up, that she must be da 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 da. So if she goes out with another boy, Habis, if she does this, Habis, it is what we call conditional love. It revolves around the fact of I, me, my, the three things that the Buddha wants us to overcome. So when we have conflict between emotions and logic, if that emotion is emotion which revolves around I, my, mine, then you're going to have suffering. When you realize that, 
then you will realize that, that emotions are not correct. These are not wholesome emotions. When it is a wholesome emotion, you will not usually have any form of conflict with what your logical mind is telling you. For example, if you do something good, you have an emotion, arise, uh, emotion under inverted commas that arise that I have done something good. Your logical mind agrees with you. Now both are in unison. But let me give you another example. Those of you who are Star Trek fans may remember that episode where Spock dies. The USS Enterprise was in serious trouble. They had to close a nuclear leak. But to cut off that nuclear leak, the person who goes inside will die because he will be exposed to huge amounts of radiation. Mr. Spock, without even a blink, rushed into that chamber and locked off, cut off that leak. And of course, he had to seal it to make sure the radiation doesn't escape. The other members rushed down and Captain Kirk at that time, Admiral Kirk, was there. And he asked him, why Spock, why? And Spock replied, the needs of the few or the many overcome the needs of the one. You understand what Spock said? His decision wasn't based on himself. His decision was based on the needs of the few or the many of the enterprise crew overcomes the needs of the one. His decision was based completely on logic. Our basal emotions of our brain stem and limbic system might tell us, save myself, law, run, law, go into an escape pod, let the rest die. But his logic tells him no. The needs of the many overcome the needs of the one. So this is what I mean, Alexandra. Um, I've shared this on previous Friday night sharings as well. You can listen or look at it through what is already uploaded to the internet. I hope I've made it a little bit clearer for you. All right. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you. Question four, um, the next question, question four from Didi Chia. For the younger generation who are new to Buddhism, what is the guideline to ensure that they have the right teacher, including the monastic? Dr. Kuna? Yeah, Brother Chia, good evening. There are 84,000 Dharma teachings. This is said by the Venerable Ananda. 82,000, he said, are taught by the Buddha and 2,000 by the enlightened disciples. So there's a lot of teachings quite impossible for us as lay people to actually study 84,000 Dharma teachings. Sister Li Ming will tell me it's very, very difficult and I agree 100%. But out of these 84,000 Dharma doors or Dharma teachings, there is a core, Brother Chia, which is common to all of them. Aiden is the war, is the, is the number 84,000. No matter what monastic is teaching you, no matter which lineage, which tradition, whether it's Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana, or the one I follow, which is Hahayana, all of them must teach you this 84000. Because the core of the 84,000 teachings is eight for the eightfold path. Four for the four noble truths and zero, zero, zero for the three universal characteristics. That is the very central pillar of the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha Dharma taught this in the first and second discourse. The Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, the Buddha taught the Eightfold Path and the four noble truths. The second discourse, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, he taught the three universal characteristics. Based on this two, eight, four, zero, 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 the first five arahans came to be. So Sister Li Ming, technically speaking, 
All you need to do is study the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana and the Anatta Lakana. And you should be enlightened because the first five disciples only had those two, only two. So you only need to study 83,998, put aside two you study. But the core is 84000. Any teacher that doesn't teach you this is teaching you icing, not the cake. You need the cake, brother Jeff. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pune. Okay, the last question. The last question is from uh, Sister Jeanette Ang. Sister Jeanette Ang. What should we do when we are doubtful of the teaching of the Dharma, Dharma teacher, especially when we can't ask a question? <laughs> Sister Janet, Sister Janet. Sister Janet is from Philippines. Wonderful sister. She promised me a meal and I go to the Philippines. I'm taking up on that. Okay, Sister Janet. Now, Sister Janet, the Buddha was actually teaching with regards to this. All right, the Buddha, in fact, say what will happen in the future. All right, when you will hear this teacher, that teacher, that teacher, and every one of them will be telling you, I'm teaching the, the teaching of the Buddha Dharma. And now, of course, it's with the internet. It, it's even more difficult. So first, one, I, I'm paraphrasing, of course. First, Sister Janet, you must use your wisdom. Buddhism or Buddha Dharma is all about cultivating wisdom. As you go along, you will have less questions because your wisdom will allow you to answer your own questions. You don't need to ask anybody anymore, especially me. You will have wisdom. So if you suspect that these teachers' teachings are not exactly correct, of course, we are all very polite, very diplomatic. We're not going to confront or challenge. But what you can do is, you look, is it in line with the general teachings of the Buddha? Now, what, what, what do I mean when I say in line with the general teachings of the Buddha? Now, some people think that within the Pali Canon, every word, every alphabet, every comma, every full stop is the word of the Buddha. Sadly, it is not. If you read, you will see that there are many things in there which are actually put in by subsequent generations of people. And some of the things that are put in are so audacious that it is clearly not the teachings of the Buddha. I am not joking. It is not in my position tonight to tell you exactly which sutta in which book, but believe me, there are many suttas, even within the Nikayas, which are so obviously put in by later generations, because what it claims to be the words of the Buddha is so audacious and so out of harmony with the rest of the Buddha's teachings that it is obvious that it was inserted later. So even within the Pali Canon, you will see evidence of this, let alone if we look at it overall. And great teachers like Bhikkhu Bodhi openly admit that this is very likely not the teaching of the Buddha. You can read it yourself. So I would suggest use your common sense, your wisdom, be polite, be diplomatic, counter check. In fact, that is how the Buddha taught us. How do you know your teacher is a good teacher? You need to observe him. You need to see, is he living the life he is preaching? Is he living the life of a noble one? You've got to observe two years before you can actually make a decision. But all the time now, you are learning. You have the opportunity to see for yourself, either on the internet or with teachers or with Kayana meters. And that's why I cannot under state the importance of Kayana meters. All right, Sister Janet, when I'm eating sisik with you in Manila, we will discuss this more. All right. Thank you, Dr. Buna. Thank you everyone for posting your questions today. I hope some of your doubts and myths has been clarified. We shall end the Q&A session here.